Amen. God bless you all tonight, saints. Amen. We certainly deem it a privilege to be in God's house tonight. How many can say amen to that? Amen. We come to see what God has in store for us tonight. Amen. Amen. We come to glean in the field of Boaz. So whatever he, whatever handfully he throw out for us, we want to make sure and we make the most of it. Amen. So we just want to stand as we begin our service tonight to those of you who are on the, the internet looking in. We certainly welcome you all. We hope that your hearts will be blessed tonight with whatever the Lord have in store for us. Let's just sing this little song, be strong in the Lord, be in power. How many believe that this is not a natural fight we fight in? It's not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities and powers and spiritual weakness in high places. Amen? So we need to have our armor on. Be strong in the Lord, be in power. To your union with Him, draw all your strength. Put on the armor that God supplied, that you, you may be able to stand. We are not wrestling with flesh and blood. With flesh and blood Contending with physical things But we're standing in faith But we're standing in faith Against the rulers of this world Empowered by His Spirit In the authority of His name Strong in the Lord be empowered to a union with Him. Draw all your strength. Oh, yes, put on the armor that God, that God supplies, that you, you may be. Haven't shot your feet. Haven't shot your feet with the good news of peace. Good in your loins with a true. The breastplate of righteousness. shield of faith and the sword of the spirit be strong in the Lord be in power be a union with him draw all your strength all your strength put on the armor Supply that you, you may be able to stand. Now stand and complete in his image. Refusing to be shaken from your place. Spirit of the Lord interceding on behalf of all the saints. Be strong in the Lord, be empowered. Supply that you, 
Heal me, Abel. Now stand and complete in his image. Now stand and complete in his image. Refusing to be shaken from your place. The Spirit of the Lord interceded on behalf of all the saints. Well, be strong in the Lord, be empowered. Do your union with Him draw. time be strong in the Lord be in power be strong in the Lord be in power if we could ask for a Matthew if you could come and just open us in a word of prayer Blessed be your wonderful name, Father. Truly, Lord, in your strength we can stand, Lord. In you we are victorious, Lord. In you, Lord, we have all things, Father. So, blessed, Lord, we give praise and thanks to your name. Praise your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Can we just bow our heads, reverence his presence this evening? Precious Lord, it's indeed a privilege, Lord, to come into your house this evening, to gather with saints of like precious faith on the expectation that you will come and visit with us. You will come down and meet with the needs of your people. You will come and cut hearts and lives. Draw your children closer. Unite us with your word. Make us ready and prepared for the hour of your coming. For Lord, late is the hour. And Father, it becometh us that Lord desire to Lord us walk with you to surrender ourselves to lay our all on the altar, to commit our life and just to have a closer walk, Father, to see your hand in guidance and leadership and direction, to see every day, Lord, just a little more of you in us, Lord, more of your word becoming flesh in us, Lord, more of you taking over, having preeminence in your bride. So, Father, bless this service this evening. Bless your children gathered here. Those still in there, we hear send their footsteps and bring them, Lord. And remember, even those on the internet streaming in, Lord, that each and every one receive a blessing from your truth. This evening, Father, Lord, you come and speak to the hearts of your people. You come and minister to the needs. You come and anoint your faith. Come and just take charge over their lives. Come and purge out, leave and empty us out of all the wood and all anything that contrary, Lord. And make us, Lord, vessels of honor, instruments in your hands that will give praise and thanks to your name. Bless our service this evening. Bless the song leader, the musicians, the singers, the worshipers, everyone in your house standing at their post of duty, giving praise to your name. Bless your people, Father, and take control and have your own way, for we commit all things to your charge. The wonderful, the precious name, the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. How many can give the Lord a hand clap offering tonight? Are you happy to be in God's house tonight? Turn around and welcome somebody into God's house. Tell him it's good to have them. It's good to be here. Way out. Healing is a gift. How many appreciate when songs is written? Inside the realm of the message. Amen. When the Lord said, Do our work, He just sent songs with it to Him. So 
Hvis der er godt tænkt at synge, men vi har en masse songs, vi synger med men. Healing is a gift that attracts the little fish, and it goes way out to catch rainbow trout. Discernment is a sign. That there is something more sublime And it goes way out The catch rainbow trout And it goes way, way out Into the depths of sin Redeeming us to Him And it goes way It's the opening of the word. It's a dead love. It's the breaking of bread. It's sight to the blind. It's the voice of the beloved. It's new wine. It's a revelation then. The ring cloud mystery. That I stood my hearts back to the pit That began at Calvary And it goes way, way out Into the depths of sin Redeeming us to Him And it goes way, way out It's the opening of It's the opening of the seals It's a king's sword in your hand It's having full of many and It's a token It's preaching to the lost And setting captives free It's the adoption of sons Sin Mark 11, 23 And it goes way, way out Into the depths of sin Redeeming us to Him And it goes way, way out It's the opening of the word It's a good book It's the breaking of bread It's a sight to the blind It's the voice of the beloved It's new wine It's Revelation 10 The ring cloud mystery That I stood my heart's back to the pit That began at Calvary Redeeming us to Him And it goes way, way out It's the opening of the word It's And it goes way out And it goes way, way out Into the depths of sin It's the opening of the world Well, it's a good world America, thank God for our third world tonight Lord, we love you, Father We bless your name Lord, we thank you, Lord That you didn't stop at the first and the second pull Lord, the signs, Lord, they are just Lord, the healings and the gifts Lord, those things are just a sign, Lord To direct us into a certain path Lord, but as the prophet said, there's always a voice behind the sign. So, Lord, we thank you for the third pull. Lord, the voice that was behind the sign. Lord, and I pray, Lord, that everyone, I believe that every one of us is gathered here tonight. 
Lord, not only because of the signs, because if we was gathered here because of the signs, we would have still been Pentecost. But Lord, we are gathered here tonight because of the voice behind the sign. Lord, how we thank you. How many can lift your hands and tell you, Lord, how much you love him tonight? Lord, we love you. Lord, we bless your name. Amen. See, it's good to sing the message songs, you know. You see, because after the opening of the seals, is a new song that they sang. So it's good to sing all the old songs. We still believe in all the old songs and we sing them and we love them all the same. But there's a new song we're singing tonight. Amen. Tonight I want to especially um, wish John happy birthday. He, today is his 36th birthday. And he... Um, He take me by surprise this evening, you know, normally people just ask for a one song to be dedicated if it's your birthday and thing. John said, my whole list. A whole list of songs. Well, I, can't, I can't do the whole list, but you know, I would try to sing as much as possible. So, you know, John always like the, the songs that we written in the message. So, so we just want to sing this little song before we... Today is also um, Sister Isha son, but it's easy. Today is easy, but we want to give Lil Izzy a, a round of applause as well. You know, it's easy. Next up and coming drama we have in the corner there. You know. And then today is also Sister Sister Rachel's daughter. Sister Rachel Scott. Yeah, Sister Rachel Scott, her daughter. Today is her birthday. She's not here tonight, but we still. Want to give her a round of applause? She probably might be listening on the stream. You know, March full up our birthdays on it. I have a set of birthday this week, so we, we wouldn't stop counting. There's a lot of birthdays we have. Sister Stacia, we have Sister Lisa. We have a lot of them this month. So, God bless all of y'all. Happy birthday to everybody. Who? Who's birthday? <laughs> Who find herself in the month of March? Amen. We love all of you. All right. Um, we want to sing this little song. I love to sing and shout and praise the Lord. How many? Yeah, I love to sing and shout and praise the Lord, sir. If, if you could also put on a... Um, Chris, if you could put on Zoe, Zoe mic. Amen. So we just sing this song. Clap, dance. If you feel free to dance in the, in the, in the eyes, only go ahead. And after we'll have our seats. I love to sing and shout and praise the Lord For He is good and His mercy is enduring forever I love to play music and make a joyful noise to the Lord And like David to dance And seal until the day of redemption That is why I love to sing and shout and pray In the Lord For He is good and His mercy endure forever I love to play
How many love that? Hey Amen. Y'all can have your seats. We love to sing and shout on praise the Lord. All right, so I'll sing this song for John. This was on the list, right? Divine Mystery. The days are all done, yeah. My maker is come again And to his kingdom there shall be no end Mercy is calling me Eternity is back again. Corruption cannot take me, I was born to be free. You see, not one here will be lost, he'll restore it to me. Divine providence is what the devil A divine mystery Well, a divine mystery This world did see The flashes The flashes of red light Are ever before my eyes The increase of humanity Is beyond Calling me 
in the distance the train I hear but then the sound of silence so loud in my head you see though disasters may fall he is always with me divine mystery tonight you believe in divine providence you know in the midst of the amount of people we have and you know I'm doing a project for work there and I was checking the population in the year 1800 they only had 1 billion people on it that was just 200 years ago they, oh, they now hit 1 billion people and in a matter of 200 years just 200 years the earth today is over 7.8 billion people and by 2030 is projected to reach 8.5 billion people. Imagine that. Genesis, Genesis 6 says, and men begin to multiply on the face of the earth. And as it was back then, it's going to be here now. Brother Abraham said that's one of the flashing lights, flashing signs of his coming. Amen. So we want to ask the, the ushers if they will take up the, tonight's sites and offering. I already passed my time. Um, we just want to sing this little song in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We believe we have the victory in the name of Jesus. Jesus, we will have the victory in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, demons will have to flee. Who can tell? I'm in 
the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We will have the victory. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Demons will have to flee. set me free well I'm so glad my Jesus set me free singing glory hallelujah Jesus set me I'm on my way I'm on shout Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad that my Jesus lifted me. Singing glory, hallelujah. Well, Jesus lifted me. I'm on my way to heaven. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we are assembled here tonight, Lord, in accordance to your word. Lord, in the midst of, Lord, so many activities and so many temptations outside there, Lord, we could, Lord, be caught up in, Lord, your children decided, Lord, that, Lord, we want to come into your house. Because when we come into your house, Lord, we feel fulfilled, Lord, because that is what we was created to do, Lord, is to come and praise and worship your name, Lord. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, we Thank you for health and strength that we can lift our hands, lift our voices, Lord, and sing and shout and praise the Lord. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, also for the tithes and the offering that, Lord, your children have brought into your house. We pray, Lord, that you would bless it. Lord, and sanctify it, Lord, and may it be used for this gospel as long as it would have us here on this earth. In no other name we ask it, but in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How many can say amen tonight? May we all stand. Lord, lead me into a faith. How many want to be led into a faith that you have never had before? That's wrapped in faith. There's more faith than what you require for divine healing. G. G. Lead me into a faith. A faith I've never had before. This is our faith, you know. This is the time when we have to get it. May you find rest inside this heart That I may know you more And 
you could lift your hand. The eternal Father, we come before you, Lord, tonight. We want to bring all our prayer requests before you, first of all, Father, asking thee that may you come, Father, Lord, tonight, and in your visitation, Father, may you attend to every prayer request, Father, that, Lord, there is in the midst of your people tonight. I pray, O oh God, that your blessings would be upon them, the desires of their hearts would be met according to thy will. May you touch them, Father and Lord. We want to thank you again that you could bring us into the house of the Lord. Contrary, Father, Lord Jesus, to the, the weather pattern, Father, Lord, we are thankful that we could come through the rain and be in the sanctuary tonight to come and sing and worship you and give you praise and honor we take great pleasure in doing that father we appreciate the angels of god who are here and camp about us associating with us father in our worship service tonight we remember in the open door age how angels would come and sing and their voices would be heard it would be a nice experience father for us also to hear angels singing in our midst. We always want to have a welcoming environment, a welcoming atmosphere here, Father, for your presence and for your angelic entourage. Lord, may you always be here with us and glorify yourself in the midst of your people. As we thank you, Father, we give you the praise and honor. And we pray tonight, Father, that, Lord, you will have the charge over Lord Jesus, this next testimony type service, Father, that Lord we will have. And Lord, we know that in the hour that we are living in, we do remember very clearly, Father, what you have said. Even though we had not been here when your servant 
walk the face of the earth. Some of us were not yet born when he would have departed. But even though we had not been there, Father, we believe every bit of what had been declared, Father, Lord Jesus, for us in this end time, according to scriptures like Malachi 4, Revelation 10, 7, Luke 17, 30, Revelation 3, chapter 4, chapter 3, verse 14 to 21 to 20. And Lord Jesus, we want to thank you, O oh God, that you have opened the eyes of our understanding. We are living in a space of time now where we have a lot of critics, Father, Lord Jesus, who stand against the message of the hour. We know, Father, that, Lord, there would be those who would never come and they would reject it. But when we see amongst ourselves, Father, people rising up from amongst us. St. Paul, your servant, said to the early Ephesians, that they will rise up from amongst you or they will come from outside in. And we have been seeing, Father, a lot of that taking place in this hour. But we as the Ephesian Tabernacle, we want to stand and be faithful, Father Lord, to every bit of word that you have given us in this end time. It determines our destination. And we don't want to do it all because of our desire to, to find that destiny. But Lord, we want to do it because of loving our heart for your word. May you help us tonight, Father. And Lord, may you bless this service in a very special way. Those who, Lord, documented and spoke these things, Father, that Lord would be heard tonight. I pray, O oh God, that you would bless all those who would be hearing and listening and following certain parts as it unfolded inside of the 20th into the 21st century so we want to thank you god for your messenger of the age and for all that you have said and all that you have done for rapturing faith father for our people in this hour thank you again father we commit the ephesian believers into thy hands and pray that your blessings would be upon each and every one of them those who are in the internet and following the service i pray oh god that your hand would be upon them and we do commit them into thy hands if there be any father who have not yet known what you are doing in this hour and they they come coming into this meeting tonight let it be that something would be said something would be done that will be able to draw their attention Lord, uh, what is happening, what is taking place in this hour, that people will know that they need to come out from amongst her, my people and be not partakers of her sins. May you please remember us. So we commit this service into thy hands. In Jesus' name, O oh Lord, we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. God bless you. Turn around. Tell somebody God bless them next to you. So we want to give you another, it, it is not like more, it's not like more, not like testimonial type services, but it is something that brother Johnny Jenkins, he, he documented certain events and times and places in brother Branham's ministry. And um, he did a recording on it and he would use different brethren like who had been involved but like Brother Macuges and these different brethren who were involved in different events of Brother Branham's life and testimony, so that they personally will tell us, you know, for themselves exactly what was their experience during that time, you know, when it unfolded. Because you find that what we have today is a lot of people, they go in into the experiences of the prophet and criticize every bit of it. And that, that is those who came and born and grew up with the message of the hour we want to make sure that you know we stay you know char in the right in the right position charged and you know well directed in the message of the hour all right so we want to take the revelation chapter 10 scripture and read it tonight and then introduce this documentary um of what was said by brothers who had been witnesses of 
personal witnesses of what the events that transpired during that time. Amen. So they will bring you from, I believe, from the 50s or the 40s right up into the 60s. And they will tell you exactly different places what the prophet would have been talking about. So when you have people trying to criticize it, you have those who are actually there testifying to themselves, being a true witness of what the prophet had been talking about. We're not doing it because we feel that we are challenged to disbelieve, but I don't think we, we are challenged to disbelieve anything in this word. Amen. And even if that challenge comes, it's like no challenge at all. Amen. Because with services like David and Goliath and David and Saul and David and the bear and David and the lion, I'm sorry for everything else that come up against you, you know, with what you have in store for them. Amen. So let us stand and read the word. Revelation chapter 10 verse 7. The scripture say, let us read it together. Everybody know that scripture. Let us read it together. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to song, the mystery of God should be finished as he has declared unto his servants, the prophets. Now you see, servants plural, prophets plural. Two servants, two prophets. Servants, well you have seven church ages, seven servants, but in this case we are talking about as he has declared unto his servants, the word come to the prophet. Servants, plural, is Paul and Brother Branham. Prophets, plural, two prophets, Paul and Brother Branham. Amen. So God bless you. Be seated as we introduce this service to you. It was 1909 in a lonely old cabin where a baby was born with a sign over him. The pillar of fire came down that day and whirled him through the window in the room where he lay. As he grew Light that came in. The Lord had forsaken my faith and my man till an angel came down. Arizona was not unknown territory to William Branham. As a young child, it was the land of his dreams. In 1927, a Jeffersonville family named Francisco needed help to make the long drive from Indiana to Arizona. After nearly two weeks on the road, they arrived in Phoenix, where Billy soon found work on a ranch. Only a few months later, in 1929, he was called back to Jeffersonville for the funeral of his brother Edward. Many years later, on January 4, 1963, William Branham, a prophet of God, moved his entire family to the desert region near Tucson. He too knew he would be going into the wilderness, for God had called his end-time prophet Elijah to a time of communion. In 1927, Billy went to Arizona to satisfy his personal dream and to escape the squalor and poverty of his boyhood home. Perhaps he was also running from God. Thirty-five years later, nearly at the end of his life, he moved his family to Arizona to obey the will of God. Brother Branham often wondered why he had to go to the back side of the desert he found the answer in the Bible in the lives of Moses and the Apostle Paul. All three were called into the desert to meet God and to receive a deeper revelation of His Word and His will. Our prayer is that all who watch this DVD will have a better understanding 
of the monumental events that occurred in the mountainous desert terrain surrounding Tucson, Arizona. There's a doubt in your mind what I've said. With an open heart, God will show that it's plain That William Branham is this man's name Even as a child, there was something in the young William Branham that identified with the life of an outdoorsman. This set him apart from the other children, though he loved the stories about the mighty Tarzan of the apes. And I paused to look on the web and found Tarzan fighting a gorilla and Tarzan in combat with a lion and all these various things showing the, the strength of the mighty outdoors man. But even though he liked Tarzan and told stories about how he copied that, his special love was for the novels by Zane Grey. And Zane Grey was the one that focused on the life in the West. And here we have the Writers of the Purple Sage by Zane Grey and the, the Man of the Forest by Zane Grey with the rifle over his shoulder and the Lone Star Ranger about the Texas Ranger and his uh, standing against the enemy and then the heritage of the desert with the enemy, with the Indians out in the desert. And this no doubt had a tremendous effect on the young man. And the Southwest today is somewhat even wild yet. There's still cougars and lions out there. And then at the age of 12, with a borrowed pen and paper, this longing for the deep Southwest turned into a very prophetic poem. I had a little poem I wrote, something like this. It said, uh, now, I just think I was only about 12 years old. And standing up there today looking up that canyon and thinking that lion will be sitting right here in this den room looking out the window in the glass window. I was thinking of a little poem. I went back and picked it up. Something like this. Just think how God, do you believe God's in all inspiration? God has to write a song. Do you believe God's in songs? Jesus said so. He referred back to David. Don't you know what David said in the Psalms? You know, has not it? Look at the very crucifixion. David sang it in the 22nd Psalm. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All my bones, they stare at me. They pierce my hands and my feet. You know, and that was a song. Psalms is a, is a song. And in this poetry, just watch how it come to pass. Sitting there, a little old kid with a barred sheet of paper. I said, I am lonesome, oh so lonesome, far that far away southwest, where the shadows fall the deepest over the mountain crest. I can see a lurking coyote all around the purple haze. I can hear a lobo hollering down where the longhorns graze. And somewhere up a canyon, I can hear a lion whine in that far-off Catalina Mountains at the Arizona line. Forty years later, I'm sitting right there at that canyon, that lion looking me in the face. Oh, God. There's a land beyond the river somewhere, friends. It just, it's got to be there. See, there's, there's too much speaking of it. This haunting pull to a destiny in the West continued in this young prophet's life. In a hunting accident with a fellow young hunter, his legs were nearly blown off by a shotgun. Laying in a pool of his own blood in a hospital bed, he seemed to be again in the West. A huge cross appeared, and then a sequence developed that ended up producing Christ. While telling his own life story, he speaks of how emotionally low he was at the loss of his baby Sharon Rose and the death of his wife Hope. Exhausted from work, he came home, fell asleep. There, were, there was a prairie schooner, an old covered wagon with a wheel broken, symbolizing his own broken family. There also was another surprise, one of the prettiest blonde-headed, blue-eyed young ladies he has ever seen. And as he walked up to her, she called him, Dad, what is this? 
Near the end of 1962, again, the prairie schooner symbolism was used with his family all loaded and ready to go. He snapped the reins for the lead horse to head west, and then the schooner became the family station wagon. It was time to forsake all he had called home in Jeffersonville, Indiana, and move west. Dream is becoming reality. But the Branham spoke about all this in the sermon, Is This the Sign of the End, Sirs, December 30th, 1962. He shared with his congregation something great was about to happen. Six different people at Branham Tabernacle had all shared their dream to Brother Branham. They so linked together, he felt he dare not even tell each of them what it meant. There was six dreams, and now the seventh is a vision to William Branham himself. First, a formation of little bitty birds, only an inch or so long. They looked so battle-scarred, he called them little veterans. And then bigger birds, doves. And then coming from eternity in the twinkling of an eye, a group of angels came to meet him. A further and ongoing and advance in the ministry is at hand. All of you seen it around the world. You don't go to sleep standing on a platform talking to people. You hear me go into visions and come back when I'm riding in a car with you anywhere else and tell you things that's going to happen and never fails. Never have. Has anybody ever seen it fail? No. It can't fail. It won't fail as long as it's God. Notice, right on the platform, thousands before, tens of thousands of people, even in other languages that I can't even speak, still it don't fail. See? God. Now, in this vision, or as I was speaking, I looked and I saw a strange thing. Now, it seemed like that my little son Joseph was by my side. I was talking to him. Now, if you'll watch the vision real close, you'll see why Joseph was standing there. And I looked, and there was a big bush. And on this bush, in a, in a constellation of birds, little bitty birds, about a half inch long and a half inch high. They were little veterans. Their little feathers was beat down. And there was a about two or three on the top limb, uh, six or eight on the next limb, and fifteen or twenty on the next limb, coming down in the shape of a pyramid. And those little fellows, little messengers, and they were pretty well worn out. And they were watching eastward, and I was at Tucson, Arizona, in the vision. For it made it so purpose that he didn't want me to fail to see where it was at. I was picking a sand burr off of me. From the desert. And I said, now, I know this is a vision, and I know that I'm at Tucson. And I know that them little birds there represent something. And they were watching eastward. And all of a sudden, they take taken an ocean to fly, and away they went eastward. And as soon as they left, a constellation of larger birds came. They look like doves, sharp pointed wings, kind of a gray color, a little lighter color than what these first little messengers was. And they were coming eastward swiftly. And no sooner than they got out of my sight, I turned again to look westward. And there it happened. There was a blast that actually shook the whole earth. I don't miss this. And you on tape, be sure you get this right. First, a blast. And I thought it sounded like a sound barrier. What you call it when planes cross the sound and the sound comes back to the earth. Just shook like roared everything. Then it could have been a, a, a great clap of thunder, lightning. I, I didn't see the lightning. I just heard that great blast that went forth that sounded like it was south from me, towards Mexico. But it shook the earth. And when it did, I was still looking westward and way off into eternity. I saw a constellation of something coming. 
It looked like that it might have been little dots. There could have been no less than five and not more than seven. But they were in the shape of a pyramid. Like these messengers coming. And when it did, the power of Almighty God lifted me up to meet them. And I can see it. I've, it's never left me. Us. Eight days is gone. And I can't forget it yet. I never had anything to bother me like that has. My family will tell you. I could see those angels, those shaped back wings, traveling faster than sound could travel. They come from eternity in a split like the twinkling of an eye. Not enough to bat your eye, just a twinkle. They were there. I didn't have time to count. I didn't have time or than just look. Mighty ones, great, powerful angels, snow white, wings set in heads, and they were. And when it did, I was caught up into this pyramid of constellations. As an old saying is often heard, go west, young man, go west. And this was even rehearsed into the ears of William Branham by a young fortune teller type lady who had told him, you'll never be successful in the east, your destiny lies in the west. In fulfilling this ministry, it had been shown that there would be three stages of this of this ministry. The depiction was r related to fishing. As Jesus said to Peter, I'll make thee fishers of men. So he was pulling in fish, so it became known in the ministry as the three pulls. First in the laying on of his hands, if it was a spirit disease, a series of bumps would rise on the back of the prophet's hand and actually move about. In seeing this, the patient's faith would rise at this supernatural demonstration. Then Brother Branham could call the name of the disease and the outcome. The bumps would disappear as the disease left, left the patients. Then there was a second poll. He was told, be sincere and it will come to pass that you will know the very secrets of their hearts, problems, illnesses, hidden sins. Nothing was undercover. Anyone with any sense could know that only God could know these things, names, addresses, what you were last praying about, even the position you were in when you were praying, never failing. The third pole was shown, but switched from a fishing symbolism to the vision of a huge tent or cathedral. A long line of people entered individually into a small room off on one side of the platform. Whatever went on inside was a great mystery, even, even to the people as they came out healed and made whole, praising God, what happened, I don't know. The third pull manifestation was soon to be seen as a demonstration of the power of the spoken word. If you say to this mountain, the Bible says, healing, deliverance, salvation, control of weather, creation, restoration of life, the infallible God showing that he can work through fallible man because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Once more came a further unfolding of this mysterious third pull as a prophet was kneeling in prayer up in Sabino Canyon. From nowhere came a beautiful sword into his uplifted hand. Brother Branham remarked, it fit my hand perfectly. The voice then spoke out, this is the king's sword. Well, there was only one, the king, and that's God. And his sword is his word. Placed in the hand of William Branham? No, not really. Placed in the hand of Elijah the anointing of the seventh angel of Revelations 10-7. This is the spot where Brother Brandon received the sword in his hand. Brother uh, Green and, and, a, and a couple of other brothers came to find it. And when they got to this spot, they, they just didn't know what to do, and so they decided to pray. And uh, Brother Green says that while he was praying, he had his hands out like this, and he felt the hand, his right hand begin to get warm, realizing that the sun was hitting his hand and right through the, the horn there of the saddle, or the eye of the needle, the light came shining through, and he struck his hand, and he remembered that Brother Branham said that the, the sword was glistening in the sun. And at the time of the year uh, when Brother Branham was here, uh, the, the rest of the canyon is enshadowed um, with darkness because of the winter season. And this spot right here is the only spot that receives light in the early hour, uh, morning hours. Went west wondering what was going to happen. 
One day I got a call from the Lord. I told my wife, I said, honey, I'm probably, my work is over. I didn't know. I said, God's probably finished with me now and I'll be going home. You go get with Billy. Take the children. God will make a way for you somehow. Go on live true to God. See if the children get through school. Raise them in the admonition of God. She said, Bill, you don't, you don't know that's true. I said, no, but a man couldn't survive that. One morning, the Lord woke me up and said, get up there, Mr. Bean, you tell him. I took a piece of paper and my Bible. The wife said, where are you going? I said, I don't know. I'll tell you when I come back. I went up in the canyon, climbed plumb up where the eagles was flying around. I was watching some deer standing there. I knelt down to pray and raised up my hands, and a sword struck my hand. I looked around and I thought, what's that? I'm not beside myself. Here's that sword in my hand, bright, shiny, glistening in the sun. I said, now there's not people in miles of me way up here in this canyon. Where could that come from? I heard a voice said, that's the king's sword. I said, a king knights a man with a sword. He, the voice come back said, not a king's sword, but the king's sword. The word of the Lord. said, fear not. It's only the third pull. It's the vindication of your ministry. You remember on the tape, sir, what time it is. I've quoted over it. Remember, something's fixing to take place major. Now I made the whole nation testify to it. Every yeah, newspaper on the Associated Press and one of our leading magazines and everything else testified to it all over yet. But what a privileged people. A, a privileged people is Christian. To know that in this dark hour when there's no hope, according to science, is an atomic bomb waiting for us. And no hope in our organizations ever getting together, they're consolidating with the mark of the beast. Amen. And when all of our hopes that way is gone, in our economy of our Christian fellowship amongst the organizations, it's hiding up into Catholicism which will be a mark of the beast in the confederation church. But in those who love God and are looking for reality, that the very God who made the promise in the Bible spreads it before our faith and makes the church and the people in science and magazines uh, and everything recognize that he's still God and can tell the What a time. And in Sabinia Canyon that morning, praying and wondering what would happen, holding my hands out to God up on top of that mountain, that sword dropped into my hand with a pearl handle and this guard over it and a long blade about three foot long and glistening like hot metal or like chrome, razor sharp. And I didn't know what it was. And I said, I'm afraid of these things. And just then a boy spoke that shook the canyon. That this is the sword of the Lord. And the sword of the Lord is the word of the Lord. Amen. For the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. Amen. In the spring of 1963, Brother Branham, Fred Southman, and Gene Norman went to hunt Havelina in the Sunset Mountains. And I find it extremely interesting that the gospel has traveled from the east to the west and the, just as the sunlight travels from the east to the west, if we go any further west than the United States, we're back east again. And then here we are with a final, finalized message to the Gentile people coming in the west of the United States where the sun on the gospel is setting in a state that has a symbol of a setting sun for a flag and on a mountain called Sunset Mountain. God is telling us all around, time is ending. Going hunting 40 miles northeast of Tucson, they were just exactly in the vision as stated back in Jeffersonville. As the three drove into the cove where they were to set up camp for the duration of the hunt, Gene Norman testifies that Brother Branham told him the angels have been waiting here for us all week. That's on a testimony tape recorded by George Smith of Gene Norman. In a repeat performance of Speed, seen in the vision in, the, in Jeffersonville, spoken about in 
is this the sign of the inserts? And with the boom of an airplane breaking the sound barrier, seven angels came to their appointment with the prophet. Brother Branham was caught up in their midst and commissioned to return to Jeffersonville where he would be given by Christ the mysteries hidden under the seven seals of Revelations chapter 6. Pictures of the cloud formed by the angels too high, they say, to be real, was taken from several different angles around the state and confirmed its unprecedented altitude. The most famous of them appeared in Life magazine on May 17, 1963 issue. Brother Branham explains the vision of the angels and this visit is in, again, is this the sign of the end, sir? I believe they told me Brother Hickerson just took this out of the magazine, he put it on my desk back there. That is that constellation of angels that's in the magazine that was uh, spoke of. See the pyramid shape? Look at this one on this side, the pointed wing coming with his chest out like that on my right hand side as I spoke from this same pulpit months and months and months ago. See? There it is. And Look mag or Life magazine has it, the, uh, uh, the May issue, May the 17th, I believe it is. Is that right? May the 17th issue. Mrs. Woods was telling me today that many called her and asked. That's in the May issue, May the 17th. It's a mysterious cloud. The cloud is 26 miles high and 30 miles across. And that's what we were speaking of here. And that's where the angel of the Lord came down and shook the place and the whole it sound louder. I know there's one man, If I think Brother Southman, I seen him a while ago somewhere. He's here. He was standing. Yeah, right back here. He was standing near when it happened. I guess I wasn't too far from him. I just seen, tried to wave to him, only I had his binoculars, that the, the uh, animals in which we were hunting had wasn't on this hill, and I went on the other hill. I found them the day before and told them where to go to. And I went over here where they come this way. I'll just shoot up in the air and run them back that way so that they could get their, their, their animal. So javelina is what it was. And so I went over on this side, and it wasn't, there wasn't on either side. I seen Brother Fred walk out, and it wasn't there. He went back, and Brother Norman went over the hill, and I turned, went down in a little chasm, and come up just by myself about a mile and a half through some real rugged country. And I was sat down and was just looking around. It's getting up in the day, and I was picking those what we call their goat headers. It's something like a burr. Picking them off of my trouser leg, just exactly the same kind that I saw myself doing when I was here telling you about the vision six months about before it happened. And I said, that's strange. And look how perfect north I am of Tucson. Kind of northeast makes Tucson. You remember I said a little southwest. And I said, that's strange. And I looked at, at the burr like this, picked them off of my, many of them, off of my uh, trouser legs. If you've never been there, that's a desert country. It isn't like this at all. About 20 times brighter. There's no trees and things like there is here. It's just cactus and sand. So uh, I just looked at it like that. I just raised my eyes up at about, I'd say, a half a mile from me. I saw a whole head of, a herd of javelina laying, coming out on the end where there's eating some fillery. And I thought, now, if I can just get Brother Fred and Brother Norman to there, that's just the place that evening before, the Holy Spirit was so tremendous in the camp that He was telling me things that had happened and had taken place. I had to get up and walk away from the camp. And then uh, that next morning, I went up there, and I started, I said, now, if I can get to Brother Fred, I'll get him around this mountain, which is about a, a mile this way, and I had to go about, a, about two miles or better to pick him up, maybe three. Back this way, down this, uh, what we call hogback, come up like this up top of these rugged, jagged mountains and run down this way, cut across and come over and go down in this direction and pick him up. And then you have to go plump the bottom of the hill to get Brother Norman, which would probably have been about four or five miles, then get back, and I was going to put a, a little piece of Kleenex. At the, I was going to hang on a piece of, of the mesquite there so I could point myself to which ridge to go out when I come back. And I just come up over a little ridge where there's a lot of jagged rock, and there's a, a deer trail come down the other side about all oh, 40, 50 yards beneath the cliff. It's about, oh, it's up in the day, I say, 
8 o'clock or 9, would you think something like that, Brother Fred, maybe 9 o'clock, something, I run over on this side quickly to keep the javelinas from seeing me. They're a wild boar, you know, and they're pretty scary. So I, I went over the hill this way, and cut, started running up the hill, and it just run along in a little, what we call a dog trot. And all of a sudden, the whole country just rung out. I never heard such a terrific blast. Just shuck and the rocks rolled. And I felt like I, I must have jumped five feet off the ground. Looked like it just, just scared me. I thought, oh my. I thought I'd gotten shot that somebody I had on a black hat. I thought they might have thought it was a javelina running up the mountain. Somebody had shot me. It went so loud right on me like that. Then all at once something said, look up. There it was. Then he told me, he said, open any of those seven seals, turn home. So here I come. I met Brother Fred and Brother Norman about an hour later when I found them. They were excited and talking about it. And there it is. And yeah, science says that it's impossible for, for any kind of a, a mist or anything to get that high, fog, vapor. See, it'll only go just, I wouldn't know I, I, we, when we go overseas, we travel 9,000 feet. That's above the storms. That's approximately about four miles. And say, let's say, maybe it's 15 miles till you can't get any more vapor. But this is 26 miles. And she hung there all day. They don't know what it is. But thank the Lord. <laughs> we do. <laughs> thank you, Brother Hickerson. Um, uh, keep it on my desk. Brother Branham often stated that if we observe things natural, they often are a reflection of things spiritual. So by seeing what we can see, we can understand things we cannot see. It's quite common that if the women in the church are not dressed in the modesty that's shown to us in biblical standards, so they're off the word, then there's a good chance that church is off the word. If the women in the church are dressing worldly, there's just a very good chance that the church itself is worldly. So along this same principle, it was in the fall of 1963, Brother Branham saw a striking example of this as he was sitting in a J.C. Penney department store, Tucson, Arizona, sitting in a chair near the uh, escalator, waiting for his wife, doing her shopping. Brother Branham noticed several women riding up and down on the uh, escalator, and they were dressed immodestly, but he especially noticed the green eye shadow on one woman it reminded him of a vision he had experienced when he was 14 years old, yet an unsaved boy, possibly dying. He found himself descending into hell. Some haunting-looking women come, were coming to meet him. Not pleasant. Yet here he was in downtown Tucson, seeing what he had seen 40 years before, and it dawned on him, just as heaven and eternity are blending into this age, which is yet in time, these women indicate that hell is spilling over into this dimension also. The two powers are both on display. Let me repeat that. This experience led him to the shocking conclusion, just as God was displaying His holy glory and power through the revealing of the Son of Man, Satan was revealing himself more and more through his servants. In the message, Souls That Are in Prison Now, he brought out how that Jesus descended and preached to the souls who were in prison that repented not in the long days of the suffering of Noah, but now had no ability to repent. And after his J.C. Penney experience, he could but ask himself, what if this is the third pull to the totally lost? Is this an indication that the day of grace is closing to the Gentiles? And all of the, the, the majority of the shopping was downtown. Uh, they had hotels, restaurants, you know, all of the major shopping was located in the downtown area of Tucson. Uh, and it was really the main hub for, for just about everything. There were beginning at that time to build restaurants, you know, out towards the east side of town. Uh, there were, you know, obviously grocery stores and things like that. But the majority of the, you know, the shopping for clothing and things like that were, were uh, predominantly downtown. And one of the main stores downtown was the Penny's store. 
And I remember the penny store in particular as a, as a young boy because it had an escalator. And I remember playing on the escalator, going up and down and up and down. And my mother, you know, saying, you know, don't play on the escalator because I didn't just go down the up. I went up the down and down the, you know, and, and played on it. And so it was just kind of made an impression because I would be playing on it while she was doing her shopping. And as I got older, I remember going there and, and uh, you know, kind of, you know, shopping for clothing for school and remembered that they had these white t-shirts that we used to like as I was growing up and getting older. Uh, downstairs on the escalator, we'd go down and to the right, they had these tables that had the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, men's t-shirts, the white t-shirts. And so I vividly remember that, you know, those, that escalator and going up and down it and even as I was older I always remember there was one of the few places in all of Tucson that had had an escalator at that time and when they started building the malls you know around town then of course some of the stores moved from the downtown area and moved into those mall areas and then they started closing the downtown ones and currently I believe that they've torn it all down that area where the penny store was and they've replaced it with the, you know, the uh, downtown library, and, and there's a, a, a little park down there. Now, I never noticed it too much until about four weeks ago. The wife never thought of it in this terms. About four weeks ago, the wife and I went down to Tucson to do some shopping. And while we were sitting, the wife, we ran downstairs and... And there was a bunch of sissy-like boys, had their hair red, as you know, like the women does, and, and bangs combed down here in front, and these real high trousers on, kind of, I guess the beat necks or what you call them. And they were in there, and everybody's looking at them, and their heads is that big like the women that wears these here, a water head haircut, you know. And they were down there, and a young woman come by, and she said, what do you think about that? I said, then you ought to be ashamed of yourself, if you can think that. I said, he has just as much right to do it as you do. Neither one of you have a right. So... I went upstairs and I sat down, and when I did, there's an escalator. It was a J.C. Penny store, and the escalator bringing the people up. Well, I really turned sick at my stomach of seeing those women come up there, young, old, and indifferent, wrinkled, young, and every way, with little bitty shorts on, their filthy body, and those sexy dressed women with those great big heads uh, like that and here they come and one coming around that escalator is coming right up like that where I was sitting back in a chair sitting there with my head down and I turned and looked and one of them coming up the steps was saying who was Spanish speaking to another woman she was a white woman speaking to the Spanish woman and when I looked all of the ones I was changed there I'd seen that before. Her eyes, you know how the women are doing now, painting their eyes just recently like cat. You know, put it up like this. And wearing cat glasses and everything, you know, with eyes up like this. And that green stuff out of their eyes, there was that thing that I seen when I was a child. There was the woman, just exactly. And I just got numb all over and began to look around. And there was those people mumbling, you know, going on about the prices and things in the building. It looked like it. I just changed for a moment. And I looked and I thought, that's what I saw in hell. There they was, that canker. I thought because they were in hell, what made them that way, a greenish blue uh, under their eyes. And here was these women painted with greenish blue. Just the way that vision said about 40 years ago. Okay? And about 40 years ago is what it's been. I'm 54. I was 14. So about 40 years ago, I, and that's the, the, that's the number anyhow of the judgment jury. Now, there was, I've seen that, and I couldn't even speak to my wife when she comes. She's over there trying to get a stare and the kids some kind of a, a dress or something for school. And I, I couldn't even, I couldn't even speak to her. And she said, what's the matter? Are you sick? I said, no. Something's just happened. Now, she don't know. She's waiting for this tape to return. I've never said it to nobody. And I thought I'd wait, as I promised, bring it to the church first. Okay? Bring it to the church. And that's my promise. 
And you'll realize after tonight reason I try to keep my promise. And I thought then as I noticed them tankered looking eyes on them women. There were the Spanish, the French, and Indian, and white, and all together. But that great big head, you know, bushed up with that combs where they comb it back, way big, and then comes out, you know, you know how they do it, fix it in the, uh, like this, and then them tanker looking eyes, and the eyes with a paint that run back like a cat's eye. And then talking, and there I was again, standing there in J.C. Penney's store, back in hell again. I, I, I got so scared, I thought, Lord, Surely I haven't died, and you've let me come to this place after all. And there they were, making this ground like at a, in that vision, like you could just barely hear it with your ears, you know, just the mumble and going on people. And then women coming up that escalator and walking around there, and like, ooh, ooh. there's them green, funny-looking eyes, mourn. Wife come up, and I said, just let me alone with me, honey. I said, if you don't mind, I, I want to go home. And she said... Are you sick? I said, no. Just go ahead, honey, if you got any shopping to do. She said, no, I'm finished. And I said, let me take you by the hall. See? I walked up. She said, what's the matter? I said, matey, I, 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 something happened up there. And while I was under that, I thought this. What day are we living in? Could this be the third floor? God sends a message to earth, it's mercy to those who can receive it, but judgment to those who reject. All you have to do is think about Noah, and the picture becomes very clear. To spurn mercy, there nothing remains but judgment. Sadly, this is the condition of the church and the world today. February 29th, 1964, the angel of the Lord spoke to Brother Branham and told him, pick up a rock and throw it in the air. As it fell back down to the ground, Brother Branham said, Thus saith the Lord, you will see something happen right away. He told his friends that within 24 hours they would see the glory of the Lord firsthand. The very next day, on March 1st, a whirlwind roared through the canyon, ascending and descending over the uh, Brother Branham three times. The tops of the trees were chopped off, and a portion of the canyon wall was blasted away. Strangely, the rocks that fell into the campsite all had a pyramid shape on at least one side. When asked what the whirlwind represented, Brother Branham told his hunting partners this visitation was a prophetic sign of impending judgment for the west coast of America. Twenty-seven days later on Good Friday, remember that name, the, that judgment began near Prince William Sound off the coast of Alaska when a 9.2 magnitude earthquake followed by a huge tsunami, took the lives of 128 people, caused millions of dollars in damage. Thus saith the Lord, follow that, the judgments of God started in the earth with the Alaska earthquake and will not stop. The very next Good Friday, another earthquake struck the Seattle Olympia area in Washington, only 6.5, this time on the Richter scale. 
that very day of the quake, the prophet comments while preaching in Los Angeles on a message called the choosing of a bride. That great monster laying up yonder that flipped himself over in Alaska a few days ago threw his tail up again this morning along about down around Washington. He could head this way mighty soon. I saw him get up from this table and he went over and, and we had a shovel leaning up against a tree. So he picked up this shovel and he walked over to that rock and he was shoveling dirt kind of to put the coals out, you know. And all of a sudden we heard this earth, this uh, whirlwind and it was coming straight down out of the sky and it was just screaming very loud, very loud. You could tell it wasn't anything natural. It was supernatural. But we didn't know what it was. We didn't know why or anything. And so I looked at Brother Branham, I was watching him, and he goes and he, he just looks up at it, pulls his hat off, and he stands there and looks right up in that. It came down about 10 feet off of the ground, right on the top of the little mesquite trees. And, and it was whipping those trees, just whipping them and whipping them, pulling rocks out of the cliff and, and throwing them all over the place. And he stood there, and we, every eye was glued on him. And it all of a sudden went away and went right straight back up like it came and went out of hearing. And he, he kind of acted as if he didn't know whether to talk about that or not. And uh, so as he walked back over to where we were standing, he said, you know, one time God spoke to Job in a whirlwind. And that's all he said. Then later on that afternoon, then he began to talk about it being judgment striking the West Coast and so forth. Now notice, he went in by the plan of God, foreknowledge, call of God, and the Word of God, and went in before the drought set in. Now, we know that judgment is ready to strike. Standing on the hill that day, Brother Bankswood standing here was walking up the hill. Maybe I quote it again. So that build your faith for this prayer line is fixing to take place in the next 10, 15 minutes. I was just walking ahead of Brother Banks. He was, I think he had left Sister Ruby when she was sick. And he, coming behind me, I noticed his face red. I looked back, I thought the hill might be a little hard from the pool. So I kind of slowed up, right in them deserts, right up the hills like that. Right where the angels of the Lord appeared, was heading right in that direction then, where they had appeared a few months before that. And as I went up the hill, the Spirit of God, when I turned around and looked on top of the mountain, He said, pick up that rock and say to him, Thus saith the Lord. You'll see the glory of God in the next few hours. I just picked up the rock and said, Brother Banks, I don't know why. Throw it up the air, and I said, Thus saith the Lord, you're going to see the glory of God. He said, That meant Ruby. I said, No, I don't think it had anything to do with you, Banks, or Ruby, either one. I just think it was just saying, Thus saith the Lord, something's going to happen. And the next morning, when we were standing there, many of the men, I don't know how many sitting here now, there's 12 or 14, 15 of us sitting there. All of a sudden, a minister walked up to me and he said, Brother Branham, he said, uh, My name is so and so. He said, I was. Uh, one of your sponsors in California, I said, I'm glad to meet you, sir. Douglas McHugh. He said, I'm, I said, I'm glad to meet you. Shook hands with him. He said, well, now, I want to ask you a question. He said, Roy Roberson, trustee here, Brother Woods, Terry, and Billy, and all, Brother McAnally, and I don't know who all were standing there. And I, he said, I want to ask you something. He said, does the Lord ever give you visions out like this? I said, yes, brother, but I come out here to kind of get away from it, to rest up. And I looked around like this, and I seen a heavy set doctor looking at him and said, Reverend McHugh, this allergy in your eye will soon put your eye out of Dr. G for two years, and I can do nothing about it. 
And I turned around to him and I said, what you asked me that for, your doctor told you the other day that allergy was in your eye in the middle of the day about 11 o'clock and he's wearing sunglasses. I said, the reason you're not wearing that because it's the sun is because of your eye. He told you you was going to lose that eye and he started crying. So that's right. I turned to walk around again and had a shovel in my hand. And I looked and I see him standing there looking at me, his eyes just as bright. I said, but thus saith the Lord. You're not going to lose that eye. Huh? I was hunting with him this last fall. He could see better than me and anybody in the crowd. You know? And I seen an elderly lady pull down her stock and raise up the side of her skirt. She said, son, if you see Brother Branham, tell him to pray for my feet. And I looked down there and little, little tumors hanging on her feet all around. I said, your mother's a gray-headed lady. My son, you see. She told you before you left, if you see me to have me to pray for her feet. She's got little tumors like hanging on her feet. He likes to faint it. But that's the truth. I said, tell her not to worry. It'll be all right. I started to walk around, then I heard the voice of God speak, said, get out of the way quickly. Roy Roberts is standing there knowing he was a veteran of the war. I put my hand on his shoulder. I said, Brother Roy, hide as quick as you can. So what's the matter? I said, get out of the way, hide. And just started walking around, put my shovel down, turned around, took off my hat, and here he come. Glory of God falling in a whirlwind that tore the side of the mountain out. Like that, it blasted and shook the place like that. Cut the top of the bushes out. It's about three or four or five feet above my head. Went back up like a funnel like that. It blasted again and here it come three times. Then when it left the third time, Brother Banks came over and said, That's what you just talked about. I said, Yes. I said, what was it? I said, God appears in whirlwinds. I didn't know whether he wanted me to tell the people or not. And I went on and prayed a little bit. Then he told me I could tell him. I said, It's judgment striking the West Coast. Look at her today. Look what happened a few hours after that. Alaska sunk, and now the whole thing is going under. We're entering into the judgment. Mercy's been spared. But thanks be to God, we got hidden food, spiritual food, that we're living on the goodness and mercy of the revelation of Jesus Christ in these last days, vindicating himself among his people. Hey, man, they went in. Elijah went in before the drought set in. Thank God for being in before the judgment sets in. Now's a time of coming out and going in. <laughs> getting out of those organizations, getting into Christ. Of coming out and going in time for all true believers. You will hear many times on tape people asking Brother Branham to explain all the ramifications surrounding marriage and divorce. He knew he would have to preach on it one day. But the topic is perhaps one of the most difficult subjects in the Bible unknown to most Bible students. The varied consequences of this sticky subject matter left him in despair, sent him into deeper prayer than almost any other doctrine, for he was fully aware that many sheep in his own church were not scripturally united. With the level of understanding he had, he did not want to see all these people's families, wives, husbands, children, hurt by a marital breakup, but what could he do? The Lord called Brother Branham into the mountains outside of Tucson, the angel of the Lord came down on the mountain known as Finger Rock in the form of a pulsating amber cloud. This one was not the usual seen by prophetic eyes only. The brothers had a service station owned by Brother Welch and stood watching. Teachers even called the school children out of their classes to watch the fiery looking amber cloud go up into the air and then back down to the area surrounding the prophet. Finally, the Lord had given the prophet that added revelation he felt he needed in order to preach on the subject of marriage and divorce. In the Easter seal, preached in April 1965, a sword in your hand said, go home and open those seven seals that are given. And here they are, the true mystery of marriage and divorce, the serpent seed, and all these things that's fussed about, it's thus saith the Lord. Right. Yes. So, but as far as the people were concerned, so they saw him as a prophet, like the woman at the well. She said, right. you know, yeah. thou art yeah. a prophet. So they saw him as a prophet, which was nice, but not enough. Right. Some saw him as a gifted man. And that was nice, but that wasn't enough. See, they didn't see him in the scripture. Right. Right. So that group was a big group of people. Then there were other many denominational people, and they were in a state of, uh, they were in a very difficult place in that they knew the presence of the angel of the Lord, 
they knew because you could sense it, you could feel it, you couldn't get away from it. And he would speak and reveal the secret of the heart to the people who came up and would always say, is that true, is that true? So they were having difficulty, you know, identifying that as just a gift and they knew that it was, uh, you know, unusual, it was something more, but they couldn't really identify it. And so there were many, but that's where they began to really turn from him. And at the end, he says, you know, there, I've moved here to Tucson and uh, there has been no open doors. Right, right. See? And tied that to Jesus standing outside yeah. the door. You get my tape on marriage and divorce, and up on top of the mountain at Tucson, here not long ago, I was up there praying about it. They dismissed the schools to watch that pillar of fire circling the mountain and going in a funnel back and forth, up Amen. and down. Amen. People around here knows it. They're inside. And it, when he told me the truth of this marriage and divorce questions, if there's one side going this way and one going that way, there's got to be a truth somewhere. And after those seven seals, he showed what was the truth of it. This is to my church only, the, not my church, the little flock that believes me and follows me. This is to them. The other day, knowing that when I tell you anything, it must come, thus saith the Lord. Then I had the scriptures as he revealed it to me. But Lord God, what can I say to that congregation? I'll have separations. Man will be steady on the porch and out in the yard and everywhere else. Shall I leave her? Women, shall I leave my husband? What shall I do? I said, Lord, what can I do? Something said to me, go up yonder in the mountain. I'll talk to you. And while I was up in the mountain, not knowing that down in Tucson, they were seeing me. But even the teachers called the children from my little girl in there, from the schoolroom. And said, look yonder in that mountain. There's a fiery looking amber cloud going up in the air and coming back down, going up in the air and coming back down. <laughs> Miss Evans, are you here? Ronnie, are you here? I come on back down to the station, this young boy by the filling station, the Evans filling station there. And before I know what the boy was going to say, he took me on my feet. He said, Brother Branham, you was up in that mountain over yonder, wasn't you? I said, what do you mean, Ronnie? No. See, to see what he was going to do. A lot of times things happen. Don't, you don't say it to people. It becomes the thing of... The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation that was given to me, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Brother Branham was bothered by a severe stomach ailment that would return to him every seven years, and 1965 was the next year for this unpleasant illness. In September of that year, God declared through a vision that the squirrel-like animal that represented what was inside tearing up his stomach was only six inches long. That meant it would affect him only six times. The seventh time should have come sometime later that same year. However, on September 20th, 1965, a voice spoke to Brother Branham saying, Go to the Catalina Mountains. When he climbed the trail, he found a dead squirrel-like animal impaled on a cactus. It looked exactly like the one he had seen in the vision. Then the voice of the Lord declared, Your enemy is dead. The following day, the prophet made two striking discoveries. When Brother Brandon was here, he tells on tape that he was bare chested, right? He didn't have a shirt on and he was hiking and, and he got hot and he leaned against the rock like this because the rocks are cool. So he's cooling himself on the rock and a voice spoke to him and said, what are you leaning against? And he pushed himself back and right here was the word eagle, somewhere here. Now, eagle and then he looks up and he sees that eagle rock. That morning I got up after seeing this vision. I obeyed the Lord. I took my little boy Joseph to school. He's listening to me now in Tucson. I took him to school told me that I didn't know when I'd be back. 
and I took off up into Catalina, up into the uh, the foothills, and, and went up into the place where the angel of the Lord put the sword in my hand real early, and started climbing up the mountain. Well, instead of going up in a peak this way, which is a lot of snakes, scorpions, you know how Arizona is, I turned to my right. Something said, turn to your right. I went way into the peaks. I went around, and I was going around those great, huge rocks, many times bigger than this tabernacle, laying up in them tops there where seldom ever a person could get. Along about 11 o'clock, I was going into a little cold, back where some, a little place turned in like this, over a little deer trail. And I had my shirt off, my hat my hand, because I was just lathering with sweat. And so I turned in there, and as I turned in that little cold, I felt the presence of the Lord. I jerked off my hat and looked around. Oh, it is here somewhere. I know he's here. Oh, what is it? I made a few more steps. I said, Lord, you're here somewhere. I looked laying on the path, and there laid that little squirrel. Had jumped at something and missed it, and it hit a bunch of choya, that's jumping cactus. It ran through his head, chest, stomach, and he was dead. That odd-looking little squirrel, he had missed my mouth and hit that choya. And the voice of the Lord said, your enemy is dead. I stood there, I trembled. I took my foot and that, usually crows would have eaten it up. I killed him. Snake, a couple days later, then, laid on the road about a half hour. There's always eagles and crows flying through there. They'll pick it up right now. I put, killed a coral snake. That's the most dangerous snake we got. Laying right beside of me a few days after that. I started to come back to pick it up to show it. Crows had done got it. Ravens passing over. And that had been laying there ever since I'd seen the vision two days before. I believe, it was on Saturday and I went up there on Monday. So there he was laying on there dead. I mashed it with a foot. I went back around, sat down again, sat there and cried a while and prayed. Looking down over Tucson, miles below me. Turned back around and come back and still lay there. When I entered that cold, the Spirit of God come on me again. I went on around, went down the mountain, went in and told my wife, I said, Honey, I don't know how, but I'm going to get over this. Dr. Ravensworth, when he gave me the examination, he said, It's totally impossible for you to be well. He gave me a shot of pentothal that was to last me. For five minutes, and I slept ten hours. So, uh, that stuff, and even aspirin just knocks me out. So they, he gave me a shot, put that tube down the throat. When I come to it, he told me next morning, he said, Reverend, I hate to tell you this, but said your stomach walls are even so hard, they're dried up. I never seen it. He used the name of gastritis, and I went and looked in the dictionary, and it said something is withered away. It said you can't get over it. Said you'll always have it. And I would have been a discouraged boy if it hadn't been for the vision of the Lord. And the next day something said, Go back to the mountain. And that day instead of going one way, I was led to go another way. And I was standing there. And looking set in front of me. And there sat that seventh little white dove. Looking right at me. I rubbed my eyes. I said, surely it's a vision. Surely it is. I looked and I said, little dove, where do you come from? This is pretty and white. Could have been a pigeon. Whatever it was, away in that wilderness. God Almighty, who raised up Jesus Christ from the dead, whose servant I am, his word laying here open before me, know that I tell the truth and lie not. There stepped the dove. Sitting here looking at me. I walked around, I thought, surely it's a vision. I turned my head, looked back, and there he sat there, them little white wings, just as snowy as he could be, his little yellow feet and little yellow beak. Sitting there looking at me, he's watching my straight westward. I walked around him like I wouldn't touch him for nothing. I walked on up the trail, looked back, and there he still sat watching me. Brother, as a son of Abraham, I consider not what the doctor told me. I'm going to be well anyhow. 
The third day I went back. I was climbing up high. Many of you know the vision about the Indian sheep riding that little wall to the west. Something attracted me all to a big rock. About noontime, said, lay your hands against that and pray. God in heaven knows this is truth. I laid my hands against the rock and looked up towards heaven and started praying. I heard a voice coming out of the top of the rock there. said, what are you leaning against over your heart? I raised back like this, my bare shoulders naked from the waist up, hot. I looked back, and there was rope in the quartz, in the stone, white eagle. Just exactly what the vision said that the next message would come forth by. I was so excited, I run home, got a camera, and come back the next day and took the picture of it. It was still there. Rope in the rock. White eagle. Dove leading eagle. Somehow, uh, I know, I'll tell you before it happens, the doctor's a good, do- good doctor, no doubt. Uh, I think he's a fine man. But I, I know I'm going to be over it. It's done, it's finished. I'm going to be well. I was thinking as Ernie sang that song a few moments ago, On the Wings of a Dove. How is the melody to that? Sorry for me, Ernie. Only a few days before his departure from this dimension, Brother Branham preached his final service, communion, December 12, 1965, at the Tucson Tabernacle, while yet in its first location. The building was originally the first Jewish temple in Arizona, called the Stone Avenue Temple, or Temple Emmanuel. It was incorporated March 20, 1910. 
It currently houses the Jewish Heritage Center of the Southwest. Standing in front of the church, Brother Branham was watching a Veterans Day parade, and as the band passed by the church, the music changed to Onward Christian Soldiers. Hmm, what could this mean? That same day, the pastor of the Downtown Assembly of God decided to close his church. Brother Perry was able to rent the building. The temple had served its purpose. It was indeed time to move onward, Christian soldiers. Both Jesus and Brother Branham preached their last public sermons in Jewish temples, closing out an era. In the time of Jesus, the gospel light was to transfer to the Gentiles. Simeon had said over the Christ child, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Brother Random's ministry was to restore the heart of these Gentile children back to the original apostolic Pentecostal fathers. Soon the gospel light will shift from the Gentiles and return to the Jews. You see, there was no church in Tucson when I came here. Right. Uh, Brother Branham had asked some other brothers to start them, but uh, they would not because they wanted Brother Branham to say, this is to do this, do this. But when Brother Branham came to this city, uh, per the directions of the Lord, uh, he met with the ten full gospel pastors in this city. Assemblies of God, oneness, he had, a, he had a breakfast with them or a meeting or somewhere. I wasn't here. And they were concerned about him coming to the city because if he came here and started one, they knew that he would empty their churches. Because Brother Branham couldn't even go to church with his family. Because if he went, there would be two or three hundred people who were here in the city for Brother Branham to pray for him. And if they were to find out he was going to go to a Methodist church, they'd go there at five o'clock in the morning and be waiting when the deacons got there to unlock the door and they'd just go and fill up the church and they would interrupt their program. So Brother Branham, if he went to church, he had to slip off. He had to secretly take his family and go somewhere to church. Brother Branham was a pleasure to preach to because he knew how to say amen. And you're sitting there and I felt like Paul preaching to Jesus or you know it's it just you wouldn't you don't know what to do but you, I was doing it because he told me to uh, he told Sister Branham whenever I came back from breakfast with him one time that Brother Green's coming to town and he's going to start us a church he's the kind of guy that'll get the job done and the secret was is that I found the building without Brother Branham telling me. Now, he said that the other brothers, the reason they wouldn't start one, is because they would find a building and they'd come and say, Brother Branham, is this where we're supposed to be? Well, he had told the pastors in this city he wouldn't start a church. That's the reason on the tapes from Shreveport, he says, I didn't start the church in Tucson. Brother Green did. Brother Branham had to do that to keep his word to the pastors in this city. But you see, if you want to be negative about it, you can say, well, Brother Green said that, Brother Brown said that wasn't his church. He didn't start that church. It's just according to your mental attitude about it. Yeah. But I took it because Brother Brown told me I followed the leadership of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you this, anytime you do what the Spirit of God tells you to do, there's going to be opposition to it. And they're not going to be everybody, everybody's not going to agree with you. So that, that, that was the start of Tucson Tabernacle. But that Sunday, when Brother Brown talked about it, he said, we'll be in this building, and when I grow up, we'll go to another one, we'll move to another one, and then maybe, maybe by that time, the Lord will come. You, you got to assemble ourselves together to worship God. The Bible said so. When we see this day approaching, that much more come together. If there's only two people here, you be one of them. Now that, and if we come together and worship together, then we just... Something or other about it. Jesus said, Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. Now, as I've said before, Brother Green told me, and he said it, my wife come told me what he said when I was away, that uh, 
He said this morning the pulpit was open at any time. Now, I usually, that's open for me to speak. Now, usually, I had to drive all the way to Jeffersonville, Indiana, to give a message that God gave me. To bring it to the people, go all the way to Jeffersonville, Indiana, and each one of you stringing across the country and hooking up the wires and things to get the message because that's what we're living on. That's what we're here for. Well, we don't have to do that anymore. God gives me a message, I can walk right here to the pulpit and preach it and feel free to it. And I believe by that, that God Almighty will bless you if you will just stand by this church, this group of people. Not only that, but let's go out and see if we can't get others to come in. See? Let's speak to others everywhere. Speak to them about our church and what it means. But our church, we're here. We want you to come. Bring in strangers. I'm sure it'll be good for all of us. See? We have a building which we're thankful for. We're thankful for this place together together. But high be it, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. See? For heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. And where is the place of my rest? But a body has thou prepared me. And we are a body of Christ. So as we move from one building to another building, I believe in bringing our messages and we'll come down and have healing services and anything the Lord reveals to us to do, we'll have it right here in the church until it swells out so big we have to take it somewhere else and somewhere else until Jesus comes. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. God. Dear God, as we stand here on this platform, this represents right over the altar here, we realize that we are a dying race of people as far as this earth is concerned. We look out upon the streets and see sin wrote everywhere. And that the glory of the Lord is swiftly departing. And we know when the glory of the Lord goes up, so will the church go with it. God, we want to be there. Just a few days ago, standing here on the street corner, just across the street, watching that parade go down the street, and seeing those old First War tanks leading the way, then come the big heavy Sherman tank, behind that followed on and on and on, then the Gold Star Mothers. The little broke-up family with a crying wife and a little ragged boy had lost his daddy. An old mother had lost a son. Oh, how sad to stand on a street corner and watch something like that pass. And then noticing just as they passed this building, the music changed to onward Christian soldiers. Playing their marches behind, but when they pass this spot, dear God, I'm thinking of another great time coming, and that'll be the resurrection, when the old timers will come forth first, saints and patriarchs, for we which are alive and remain shall not prevent or hinder those which are asleep, for the trumpet of God shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then when we see that great list of people going marching up through the skies, and we be standing waiting for our change, knowing that we'll fall in line also. God, make us faithful soldiers. Only those who have really associated and been in the war would know what that really meant to see those tanks rolling by. God, we think that those who've been in the battle of life will know what it means when we're waiting our turn to fall in position and place in the resurrection to go up. for this morning is an odd word, shalom. 
Shalom. In the Hebrew means peace. And that's what I say to the church this morning. Shalom. That's peace. In Finnish is called Yumalan Raha, which means God's peace upon you. Raha, God. See? God's peace. Shalom. A New Year's message is to the church elected in Jesus Christ for 1964. Not, uh, not just the church groups, but the elect, the lady, uh, the lady of, of the church, Christ's bride. See, that's who I'm addressing. We're facing here in our two subjects that we read, the two scriptures rather, a very uh, contrast one to the other. In Isaiah it says, Rise and shine, for the glory of God has come upon you. The light is here. And then the very next verse he says, Gross darkness is upon this people. And then when we are in a mixture of light and darkness, and then my uh, address to the church is Shalom, peace. Let's find out what it's all about. See? We are facing this year with both darkness and light. We are, the world is in one of the most chaotic times of darkness that it's ever stood in. And yet it's standing in the, again the most blessed light that it ever shined in. Amen. How many could say they truly enjoy that tonight? Amen. How many could give the Lord a hand clap offering for the work of some of these dedicated brothers, they do, you know, in creating this, this little documentary, this little video that we could really sit down and enjoy. Amen. And how many could say you really thank the Lord for the messenger that he sent to us in the end time? Amen. Amen. Without that word that he brought to us in this end time, we would have been lost. We would have been a denomination somewhere. But we thank God that he could uh, throw way out, throw that line way out to pick up the rainbow trout tonight. Amen? And we identified with our group. So may we all stand as we come to the end of the service tonight. You know, we we're truly blessed to be here. Amen. We just want to sing this little song. Uh, super church. She's a super race, a super church. You believe it's a super race tonight? A super, a peculiar class of people. The Holy Spirit said one night to pick up your pen and write but there's a message to the church that you must bring tell her how much I love her she's my queen and I'm a king to keep us in on for soon I'm coming tell her she's a super
church. Lord, a peculiar class of people, Lord, that you have set in the end times. Lord, you have given us, Lord, whatever it takes, Lord, to be overcomers in the end time. Lord, coming up three years, Lord, you always had a chosen few, a chosen people, Lord, who will do your will. Lord, who will have your word in the heart, like Mary. Lord, she had the word, Lord, embedded inside of her. Lord, and just like Mary, Lord, you have a class of people tonight, Lord, who that word, that gene of life, Lord, is growing inside of them, Lord. Lord, and one of these days, it will come to maturity, Lord, and we will bring forth that life. Lord, your life in us, Lord. Lord, one of these days, we will change, Lord, from these mortal vile bodies, Lord, into immortality. Lord Jesus, we will change, Lord, from this, Lord, flesh body that we have, Lord, into a body like your own glorious body, Lord. Lord, like Adam when he walked on Eden. Lord, that he could ha have dominion power, Lord. Lord, in this flesh bodies that we have, we cannot express dominion. Lord, because we are like the beasts of the field. Lord, we condescended into that, that realm. But Lord, when your life, Lord, could come and be reunited, that great theophany, Lord, be reunited with this flesh, Lord, only then we could demonstrate dominion power like Adam had in the Garden of Eden, Lord. So Father, we thank you. We bless your name. Lord, we thank you for the little time that we spent in your house tonight. Lord, we could truly say, Lord, that we were blessed to be here tonight. Lord, to look, Lord, at Lord, the life experience, Lord. Sometimes things, Lord, that we wouldn't hear, Lord, from through the messages, experiences that brothers had when they walk with you, when they walk with the prophet, when he was here on earth. Lord, it's be so nice to sit down and listen to these sometimes, Lord. Lord, it's refresh us. Lord, it's give us our refreshing, Lord. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for sending your prophet in the end time. Lord, to call out a bride in the end time here, Lord. Lord, we are a product of that ministry. Lord, and we are proud to be identified with that ministry tonight. Lord, in the face of all the many people, Lord, who might turn their back, Lord, like the, seven, the 70 who you anointed with your very own hands and you prayed over them and you tell them go and preach. Lord, Lord, that same 70 turned their back and forsake you when you said, if, if you drink of my, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. Lord, they didn't understand. A lot of things they didn't understand about your ministry. And so it is in the end time here again. A lot of things, Lord, many people don't understand about this ministry in the end time here again. And they will turn their back and they will walk out. But Lord, I remember one time you asked, you turned and you asked, Peter, will you go also? Lord, and it was a very profound thing that Peter turned and said. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? For thou alone have the words of eternal life. Lord, and we know that this message that you have sent, this pure message, is what will change us. Lord, from mortality into eternal life. So Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, and we are proud to be identified with you tonight. So help us, Lord. Help your people. Lord, and if there's any doubt in any heart tonight, Lord, I pray that you would remove any, every doubting demon that is here tonight. And may faith come and abode in the heart of every be believer tonight. Lord, we thank you. We bless your holy name. Lord, as we would go to our various homes, go with us, Lord, and guide us and protect us. Lord, and if you should tarry, and if it be your will, that we would come again another time. Lord, God permit on Sunday morning. I pray that you would return, Lord, and you would come with us. And you would, Lord, keep us in that, that channel, that atmosphere. So, Lord Jesus, when we come here on Sunday, Lord, we all of us would walk with that, every, all the individual fires that we'd have, and we'd make one big bonfire here to, uh, Sunday morning, if you're tarry. So, Lord Jesus, we commit our lives into your hands as we would go. Bless all those who was on the, on the, on the web stream, Lord, on the internet, looking on. I pray that you would anoint them in a special way, Father. May something that would have been said, Lord, to anoint the heart. Lord, and if there's any backslider amongst us tonight, Lord, restore them. Help them, Lord, to make their life right. Lord, to be ready for when you would come and catch your waiting right away. So go with us as we go. Lord, we could truly say, Lord, it was good, Lord, that we was in your house tonight. 
So we thank you, Lord, and we worship you. In no other name we ask it, but in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And may his bride say amen tonight. Amen, amen. Just turn around and greet somebody. Tell them it was good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. So when you finish, you could be seated as we are all dismissed. As we just sing this little chorus, thank you, Jesus, for the grace that you have given us. How many can thank him for his grace tonight? It's amazing grace, isn't it? We could never repay, but from our hearts, we just like to say, thank you, amen? I like to see that I I just lift our voices and sing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace, Lord. For the grace that you have given us. We could never repay, but from our hearts, we like to see that I. Thank you, Jesus. Well, thank you. Oh, Jesus. May a word in the end time, Lord. For the grace that you have given us, Lord. We can never repay, but from our hearts, we like to see. Sunday morning.